the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. I wish, wish all of you a very happy Easter in uh, this uh, beautiful s summer weather of Phoenix, Arizona. I had midnight mass in Post Falls, and a uh, uh, newly baptized convert, so pray for that soul. And then a noon mass in Denver, Colorado, and then uh, the evening mass on Easter Day here in Phoenix. And today is the greatest of all the feasts of the whole church year. This is the greatest crown, because it is the great victory of our Lord Jesus Christ. The victory of the only one in history to raise himself from the dead by his own power. As Christ told the apostles and the Jews, he said, I have the power to lay down my life, and I have the power to raise it up again. And Christ, how often when he was surrounded by the pack of wolves of the, of the Pharisees and the Jews who were contradicting him, how often our Lord answering them quite simply said, Ego sum qui sum, I am who am and uh, manifested his divinity. He said he was God, and then picked up stones to kill him because he said he was God. And when our Lord was brought before Caiaphas, our Lord, being truth itself, he cannot lie. He speaks the truth. Caiaphas asked him with his full authority, and Christ respected his authority, he had before him the Pope of the Old Testament, who had lost the faith. He didn't believe in Christ. But Christ respected his authority, because he was the official high priest. And so he asked him solemnly, I, tell, I ask you to tell us, are you Christ, the Son of the living God? Are you the Messiah? Are you the Redeemer? Are you the one foretold? And Christ answers very simply and with great majesty, I am Tutixisti, he says. You, you have said it. And then he further adds, and you shall see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with great power and majesty, referring to his glory at the second coming. And the high priest ripped his garments and he said he blasphemes. So the reason why Christ was crucified and put to death because he told, he said the truth, that he is God, that he is the Messiah, and there is no other. And he's the only one to rise from the dead. Where is Buddha? If he ever existed, Buddha is just bones and ashes. Where is Muhammad, the false prophet, Muhammad? He's bones and ashes. Where is uh, Martin Luther, the apostate priest? who broke his vows and married a nun who broke her vows and changed the words of the Bible and took out books of the Bible and denied the sacrament of confession and the primacy of Peter. And where is he? He's food for worms and ashes. You can visit his tomb. In fact, Pope Benedict XVI, to his shame, held up Martin Luther as an example for Christians to follow his own words. And then, uh, where's Joseph Smith, the founder of the Mormon psychosis? It's not even a religion, because a religion has to have sacrifice. And Joseph Smith has buried his bones and ashes. And where's our Lord Jesus Christ, the eternal King? He was dead on the cross, held in the arms of his mother, and he was buried quickly. He was wrapped in a shroud. And the third day, he rose from the dead. He rose from the dead. And the Jews, as you know, the Jews were very... Uh, the, uh, the high priests, they knew his prophecy that he would rise on the third day. So they said to the Roman soldiers, we're going to pay you money, you guard the tomb. Just in case the apostles come 
and uh, steal the body and seduce everybody, saying that he rose from the dead. So the Jews paid for the, the first eyewitnesses of the resurrection. And there they were, the Romans, these were the best soldiers of the whole empire. They were the Navy SEALs of the world. And as you know, the, the Roman soldiers, if they slept on duty on a night watch, they would be killed if they were negligent. So they were watching the tomb, and they were there for the, <laughs> the resurrection. The tremendous earthquake and the explosive light that issued from the tomb rolled the rock, broke the seals that were on the rock, and the three women on their way, very early in the morning, when they saw, they felt the earthquake and saw the bright light and saw the soldiers. And they say in the Gospels, they were a velut mortui. They were like as if dead. They were so scared, so terrified. Just put yourself in a cemetery at night and imagine one of the tombs coming to life. That would scare anybody. And this happened. So they ran to the Jews and said, we can't explain it, he must, he must be God, because we were there and the tomb is empty. So the Jews paid extra money to these, Ro to these Roman soldiers to say, don't say that you saw the, the earthquake and the, what you saw, say that just we pay you more money, just to, don't say anything about it. So, the glorious resurrection, that our Lord appeared five times on the first Easter Sunday in five far different places. Now, the enemies of Christ are always, always trying to discredit the resurrection, because the resurrection is the, is the triumph over the paganism of this world, it's the triumph over the false Judeo-Masonry, it's the triumph over the Freemasonry, it's the triumph over all the darkness, because Christ is the only light, he's the only true God. No one else has risen from the dead, that's why we adore him as God. And uh, today, with all the power of the media, with all the power of the radio and internet, you would think that today was just a normal Tuesday. And here it is, Easter Sunday, that most important feast. And we have become so pagan that there's nothing. In the airports, you would, you would never know it's Easter. You would never know we were a so-called Christian nation, which is a laughing matter, because it's not. It's not. We have become worse than pagan when the most important feast is gone. But at least you, friends of our Lord, you few soldiers left, adore him. And rejoice with the mother of God on this day, because Christ would have appeared first to his mother. The poor Virgin Mary crushed at the Passion. And she continued to live the Passion. She continued to hear the pounding of the nails, to hear the insults and mockery and blasphemies at the foot of the cross. And the, the, the terrible, frightening scourging at the pillar, the whips continued to echo through her mind seeing her innocent lamb butchered and then dead in her arms. And she laid, she laid his body in the tomb with uh, St. John and the other Marys. And they didn't have much water, they didn't have anything, so she, she washed his body down with her own tears. And as Christ, his sufferings stopped with his death, but the Virgin Mary continued to suffer. That's why Saturday is her day, the Holy Saturday. And in Catholic countries, they will have huge processions in honor of the Virgin Mary of Sorrows, carrying her statue through the streets on her day, the day of her sorrows. So Easter morning, our Lord, tradition holds, first appeared to her to raise his crushed lily, to raise his, his dove, morning so that she can sing a new song of the glory of her son 
The Virgin Mary, however, she never lost her faith. She never doubted. But the Apostles lost the faith. And the Apostles' loss of faith helps us, especially St. Thomas. Because these, uh, these uh, attackers against the resurrection, these atheists who always try to attack the resurrection, one of their arguments is that the Apostles had a collective hallucination and that they just dreamt up this resurrection which really never happened. And that's a, really a blasphemy. But look at the facts. Were the apostles, uh, were they material for hallucination? These were hard-working fishermen, down to earth. Some of them were thick, thick-headed. Our Lord had to many times remind them of many things. And St. Peter putting his foot in his mouth frequently. And these men were down to earth. They were simple, down to earth men. They weren't food for hallucination, that's for sure. And to prove it, on the day of the resurrection, were they quick to believe it? Absolutely not. They were so slow to believe that when the women reported it to him, that they saw the angels and they saw our Lord. They didn't believe it. And St. Peter and John ran to the tomb to get proof. And there were other two disciples who were already on the way home. They didn't believe in the resurrection. They already heard the reports of the women, but they didn't, you know, the women. They didn't get enough sleep. So the two disciples are walking back seven miles to Emmaus. And they lost the faith. So these apostles, they were not food for hallucination, anything but. And then finally our Lord had to appear to them later today on the first Easter Sunday. They were all, in, they were dead scared, these apostles, because they thought, we're next to be crucified. They were scared. And so when our Lord passed through the walls and walked in with his physical body, and the same majestic face of Christ, but having his wounds, and he told them, touch my hands. Put your fingers in my wounds. I'm not a ghost. Here, let me eat. Give me some bread. Give me some fish. And when the apostles finally realized the truth that this was the living Jesus Christ the King before them, how they wept. How they wept tears of repentance. And I'm sure St. Peter was the first who so bitterly betrayed him. And so Thomas was not there on the first Easter Sunday. So St. Thomas is another proof that the Apostles were not food for collective hallucination. So he didn't believe it. Even after all the other Apostles told him, look Thomas, we saw him, we felt his hands, we heard his voice, it's the same cry, we were, we're not on drugs. No, I won't believe it till I see it. A typical rationalist. But Thomas's doubting cures our doubts, says St. Gregory. And St. Thomas, a week later, next Sunday, low Sunday, Christ appears and calls Thomas. And Thomas recovers the faith, St. Thomas. Plus, if these apostles were promoting a lie of the resurrection, if it was really a lie, what advantage did they gain by preaching this? which only brought on them being imprisoned, being whipped, being outcast, being persecuted continually. They had no advantage to preach the resurrection. But they preached it because it was the truth. And it only brought on them persecution. And not only that, it finally brought on them their own brutal deaths because they did preach the resurrection. That's the Catholic faith. And all of them suffered brutal deaths, cruel deaths, except St. John, but he even was boiled in, at the Latin gate, he was boiled in boiling oil. But he came out miraculously younger and stronger. But he was persecuted. So, St. Paul also. St. Paul 
How did he turn from a zealous Jew persecuting the Catholic Church to a zealous Catholic converting the Jews? What turned him around? And it was seeing our Lord Jesus Christ physically speaking to him who knocked him off his horse after the resurrection, after the ascension. Because St. Paul never saw our Lord in the physical, in his physical earthly life. And then, of course, we Catholics now, we have a whole history of the Catholic history of so many saints, blessed, venerables, of our Lord appearing to so many souls, physically appearing, like to St. Margaret Mary of Alcorn. <clears throat> and our Lord appearing to St. Teresa of the Child Jesus. And I saw that staircase. You can see that staircase in Avila, in her convent. And on the staircase, they have the, the little statue of the baby, of the child, Jesus, standing on the stairs. And this was in the 1500s, and St. Teresa was walking up the steps, and she saw this boy in the convent. And the boy asked her, who are you? She said, I'm Teresa of Jesus, Sister Teresa of Jesus, but who are you? In other words, what are you doing here? You're, this is a cloister. You're not allowed in here. Go back home. And the boy says, I am Jesus of Teresa, and vanished. And he also appeared to her uh, scourged at the pillar. And so many mystics, like uh, Venerable Anne Catherine Emmerich, and uh, so many saints, and Padre Pio, they really saw our Lord. They really saw Him. And how many times Christ appeared, plus all the Eucharistic miracles. And at Fatima, the child Jesus appeared in the arms of St. Joseph in one of the apparitions. <coughs> so Christ is alive and we would say, in our plain English, he's alive and kicking. He is alive and glorious, victorious, eternal Kyrios, the eternal victor. And we know that the Virgin Mary is also, she's in heaven with him, with her resurrected body, her glorified body. And the Church also teaches, St. Francis de Sale held this very strongly, it's not yet defined, but someday the Church probably will define it, is the Assumption of St. Joseph, whose body is also in heaven. So the Holy Family is there, physically with their bodies. So the glorious resurrection of our Lord is powerful. And, and for, furthermore, we have, we have the irrefutable proofs of the Holy Shroud of Turin, venerated for centuries, the cloth that wrapped the body of Jesus. In NASA, when they did a study on this, they, they got the cold chills when they put it through their scanner, and the image came out as if there was a body lying underneath that cloth, because the image is a 3D image, which means there was a powerful light that burnt into the cloth, the image, and his body passed through the cloth. And so when the apostles walked in, like St. John and Peter, and they saw the shroud, the shroud wasn't turned over like when someone gets out of bed, they, they turn the sheets out and they get out. Remember, they wrapped his body, as the Jews do, like a mummy. And all the wrappings were still there, it was just only deflated, because Christ's body passed through it. And then many, many studies show the, for example, the coins in the eyes. The Jews, they put coins in the eyes, and the coins actually had to be burnt into the cloth with enough brilliance and enough heat to leave an image. And under close microscope they can pick up the actual image on the coins which show they were pounded, they didn't mint them in those days, the slaves pounded the coins, they were pounded under Pontius Pilate's time, they, were, they had the image of the staff of Pontius Pilate plus even the date, even the date. And then the pollen, the pollen shows its flowers of pollen, which only exists in Jerusalem in that area, which only bloom in April and May. 
So, we, here we are, how can we doubt the resurrection when we have mountains of evidence? And you, one has to be a real fool to reject this truth. But this is the beauty of the Catholic faith, is the, the, the powerful resurrection. And our Lord, uh, why, why did He suffer? And why did He rise from the dead? St. Thomas will give us four simple reasons. First, to give us hope and for us to strive for heaven. And to remind us that, the, that unless Christ himself suffered and shared our nature, we wouldn't really believe all this. But he really did take our nature on, and he really did suffer. And there's no suffering that any of us could ever go through, whether it be physical, emotional, uh, intellectual, in, in any way. There's no suffering that any of us go through that Christ himself did not suffer in, in, in a much higher degree. So our Lord suffered and rose to encourage us in this fight on earth to get to heaven. Secondly, says St. Thomas, He, the creator of heaven and earth, took on our flesh and suffered for us. To show us that the sufferings of this time are nothing to come to, nothing compared to the glory to come. If the Creator, the King of heaven and earth, can leave His majesty, His happiness of heaven, and come down on earth, which is the only way to, to rescue us from the chains of hell and sin, it shows us the greatness of heaven. And that's why St. Paul says, Eye has not seen, ear has not heard, nor can a man possibly imagine what God has prepared for those who love Him. And heaven is so beautiful, so great, that, that God Himself has come down and gone through the passion to show the price of your soul, to rescue your soul. The third reason St. Thomas gives is, he, our Lord gives us a real hope a real hope in the eternal happiness through the Holy Sacraments. Christ instituted seven sacraments. The sacraments didn't develop later with the Christian community. That's what the modernists say. And those were condemned by St. Pius X. No, Christ himself established seven sacraments. And the sacraments give you the grace of Christ and the Holy Eucharist is Christ himself. And the sacraments heal your soul Heal the wounds of sin. They strengthen you in this combat. And we eat the very and drink the very refreshing body, blood, soul, and of Christ to strengthen us in this battle to get to heaven. So the, the fourth reason St. Thomas gives is that you're going to rise from the dead. On the last day, all of us will rise from the dead. And the older people are going, to, are going to all appear at the age of 30. The perfect age. And you'll be strong, you'll be healthy, you'll be beautiful. Any defects will be gone. And uh, you will have eternal health and strength. And true freedom. Freedom from sin. And you'll have the qualities of a resurrected body, which means the life of grace will shine through you, the union with God by grace. You'll have always the beatific vision by the intellect. With your human eyes, you'll see all the other saints and all the, the beautiful eyes of St. Cecilia and St. Lucy, St. Teresa. You'll shake hands and embrace St. Pius X himself and St. Benedict and St. Peter and Paul. You'll be able to talk to all the Old Testament saints, St. Daniel, what was it like in the lion's den? Or Jonas, what was it like living three days in the, the, the belly of a whale? Which also prefigured the resurrection. Christ in the belly of the earth, and rising three days as Jonah was in the belly of the whale, and, and being brought up, spit out on the beach after three days. So, uh, Christ is the first to rise. And just as his body 
flew wherever he wanted, so the resurrected body, you'll be able to fly where you want. You won't need airplanes and helicopters. You won't need a car. Because all you will need to do is just desire to go, go to go up to Denver and you just fly. Because the body will be subject to the soul. And this is not dreamy stuff, because Christ's real resurrected body flew. When he ascended into heaven, it was by he ascended by his own power, without a helicopter, without a balloon, by his own strength. And that's called the gift of agility. And St. Thomas Aquinas says you'll be able to do backflips off a 500 foot cliff and a perfect dive, no problem. Or if you want to stop in midair, you'll be able to stop in midair. And uh, you'll also, will never suffer. You'll never get sick, never get cold, never get old. And then you'll all be, also be able to pass through matter. Because Christ passed through the walls in the upper room, so the resurrected body you'll be able to pass through, through the walls. So you won't need tunnels through the mountains. And the new earth, St. Thomas Aquinas says, this whole earth will be purged by fire. The new earth will be more glorious, more beautiful. And it will show the glory of God. And it's hard for us to imagine, but just think, this earth, which now is so beautiful, was already punished with the flood. It's, 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 this is really a state of punishment. But all creation groans for the glory of God, for the redemption to be accomplished. So when the new earth is made and purged by fire, what is there is going to be far more incredible, and it will reflect the beauty and the glory of the Blessed Trinity. But in hell, so much for the devil's deceptions and the Masonic lies about freedom and independence, in hell you can't move. In hell they, they can't move, they're fixed in one position for the rest of eternity, boiling hot, with people biting at them, screaming at each other, and acting like animals. And there's no compassion, and there's no love in hell. It's the absence of God. So, these four reasons St. Thomas gives that we realize that we're only travelers here on earth. We're only pilgrims. And the Holy Resurrection shows us this. So let us... Uh, Rejoice with the Blessed Virgin Mary on this beautiful feast. And it's not just today, as the world would have it. St. Augustine says the church is not boring. you got 40 days of Lent, but now you got 50 days of feasting. 50 days of living in innocence and purity and really striving to be more united to Christ by the life of grace. And... Uh, the Holy Resurrection is so powerful, so beautiful. It's the Lion of the tribe of Judah who conquers. Christ the King who conquers. And remember as Saint Jerome says, remember how the Jews gathered at the foot of the cross, the Pharisees. And they said, come down from the cross. And they mocked him and ridiculed him. Come down from the cross. If you do, we'll believe you. And they laughed and laughed, and Christ was patient. Christ was just suffering patiently. And St. Jerome says, what is more powerful? To preserve his life by coming down from the cross? Would that have convinced them? He says, no. But Christ was patient. But he waited to die and be buried. And it's far more powerful to conquer death. And Christ rose from the dead. He rose from the dead. So, in this Holy Mass, you're going to receive the same glorified body in Holy Communion. The same body that the Virgin Mary held at the foot of the cross, touched at the resurrection. The same body that the Apostles touched at the resurrection. You're going to receive our Lord's body. You're going to drink His precious blood. The refreshment the sweet wine, to strengthen your soul, to heal your soul, so that we grow really in the love of God. And 
And uh, it's also to refresh you to fight. To fight for the faith. Because you're all confirmed. And why are we confirmed? To belong to the, the church Ramada Inn? No, we belong to the church militant. And if there's any time in the Catholic history where the, the Catholics are put to the test to fight and to be militant for the Catholic truth, it's now. In this age of cowardice, in this age of mush, in this age of complete spinelessness, at least you friends, you children of the light, stand up and defend the faith. And when you, to get very practical, there, there can never be a compromise ever with any Catholic, let alone the SSPX or a bishop. You can never be a compromise with Vatican II. You can never say Vatican II is interpretable in the light of tradition. It's just not possible. It's not possible. And the new Mass, legitimate. Not possible. And the new Code of Canon Law, which contains open heresies, such as inverting the ends of marriage, is unacceptable. In the new profession of faith that Archbishop Lefebvre himself condemned, unacceptable. So, we are in this new stage of, of a new phase of the war right now. And all the traditional Catholics, all of us, us priests, every one of us is being put to the test. We are all put to the test. Do you love me, our Lord is asking, or do you want to go with the world, with the conciliar church, with the ease, with the crowd, to be normalized and regularized and cool and regularized and regular, the regular guy, branded, to not stick out like a sore thumb. But Catholics sometimes have to stick out like a sore thumb. And the early Catholics did. They stood before the whole Colosseum, professing the Catholic faith, fed to the lions, crucified openly, tortured openly. And that's our Catholic faith. And it cannot be compromised. So let's pray to the Mother of God to, to give us a strong faith. That's the beauty of the resurrection, the virtue of faith, and hope for heaven and the great love of God, which I will ask for all of you in this holy sacrifice. O Mary, conceived without sin. O Mary, conceived without sin. O Mary, conceived without sin. The Father, Son, Holy Ghost.